Hello and welcome to this uh, Pro Tools Studio webinar. My name is uh, Dave Tyler. I'm very pleased to be uh, presenting this. We have uh, some amazing uh, guests coming on this, uh, as you've seen. I'm sure the people of, of everyone signed up to uh, hear what uh, uh, DJ Swivel and Damien Lewis have got to say, um, but also to learn about uh, the new uh, Pro Tools Studio. So welcome to everyone on Zoom and also on uh, social media platforms. So we're, we're streaming this live. Um, we have a bunch of people from the Avid team who are going to be there to answer questions. So if you're on uh, Zoom, then you can use the, uh, the Q&A function, uh, which will then uh, ask the question. As I say, we've got uh, teams of people who are there to answer you directly. Or what I really encourage everyone to do is to ask questions of uh, Jordan and Damien as we go along. It'd be great to get some sort of specific questions for them about their workflow, about anything they talk about, um, so that towards the end, um, I can sort of weave some of those into, uh, into our discussion. So uh, as I say, we're gonna be talking about Pro Tools Studio, but before we do that, I wanted to uh, introduce our guests um, and get them to uh, say hi and maybe say a couple of things about themselves. So uh, Damien and Jordan, if you're there, if you pop, you turn your cameras on and get your mics on. Hey, how you doing? So, um, oh. hey, so What's I guess, guys? hey, um, so to, uh, Jordan, DJ Swivel, um, do you want to just uh, spend, give us a minute, a uh, quick uh, overview of you, what you do, um, and tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, what do I do? Well, uh, feels like a bit of everything. Um, I've been a, you know, engineer, mixer, producer for, I mean, professionally for 17 years and, and, uh, long personally longer than that. Um, you know, I've sort of touched a bit on everything in the business. I started as obviously an intern and then a recording engineer working with fabulous and, and, uh, ultimately Beyonce, um, and then I sort of focus on mixing and linked up with the chain smokers and you know, uh, mixed vocal produced, uh, and even co-produced, um, all, a lot of their records like closer and don't let me down. Um, and yeah, and now more recently I've been doing a lot more songwriting and, and, um, written like nine or eight or nine songs for BTS and, and, uh, been sort of focused on that. And I kind of like juggle all of it. Now I also make plugins too. So I don't know, it's a nice. loaded question for me, but <laughs> that's yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah. How about you, Damien? Uh, I have a kind of similar story. I started out as a professional drummer, actually, probably around uh, 15 or 16 years old in Detroit and played in a bunch of bands and just kind of naturally progressed into the recording studio. And uh, that was in Atlanta and uh, just started working as an engineer and producer and mixer and drummer. And I live in Los Angeles now and work on a lot of pop and R&B and hip hop here in L.A. And same as Jordan, I think I've probably been using Pro Tools since like version seven, I believe it was. So yeah, it's been a minute now. Right, nice. So what we're going to do is, um, as I said, we're, we're here to talk about um, Pro Tools Studio and also to, to, for you to talk about um, the way that you use Pro Tools uh, and, and so on. But so I wanted, wanted to do just spend a minute uh, just introducing Pro Tools Studio and kind of and where it fits into uh, to the Pro Tools lineup because we've introduced a new version of Pro Tools uh, in April um, that actually changed the lineup. So for the first time, we've got this um, new uh, entry level tier called Pro Tools Artist, which is really aimed at people who are getting into music creation and production. Um, and it's just under $10 a month, but it's an incredibly um, capable uh, DAW, pretty much everything you need to get going with your, you know, you know, your, your creating and your songwriting and so on. And then what we've done is we've taken what was Pro Tools software and renamed it to Pro Tools Studio, given it a bunch of new features, kept it at the same price of $299 a year. Um, and that's really aimed more at kind of serious music producers and engineers. And of course, above that, we've got um, Pro Tools Ultimate. So renaming Pro Tools Studio means that Pro Tools software has finally got a proper name. So people kind of, to differentiate it from Ultimate, people would say Pro Tools Vanilla, Pro Tools Regular, all these kind of things. So now we can get rid of all of that and we could just call it Pro Tools Studio. Um, and as I say, it's got a bunch of new features. Um, obviously, all, this, all the great stuff that you, you, know, you have in Pro Tools software already. 
uh, but you've got double the number of audio tracks now. So doubled it from 256 to 512 um, audio tracks, which is pretty massive. Uh, we've added clip effects, and we're going to talk a bit uh, about this in a bit more detail and hear from, from Jordan and Damien as to how they actually use it. We've included advanced automation. Now, I could spend at least an hour talking all about the advanced automation stuff, so we'll dive into a little bit of that, um, but as I said, that's, that's definitely worth um, kind of uh, digging into. Uh, we've got a multi-stem bounce, so you can uh, bounce uh, your, your stems, kind of multiple stems simultaneously. And then possibly the one, the, the biggie, which um, uh, people are really kind of going to be excited about is not just surround mixing, so not just 5.1 and 7.1, but Pro Tools Studio um, goes all the way up to Dolby Atmos. So that's, again, something we're going to be sort of digging into a little bit. And I, I know that's something which uh, really kind of gives uh, people who want to you know, try their hand Dolby Atmos, get their feet wet, Pro Tools Studio is now going to be the perfect platform to do that. So I wanted to just clarify a couple of things because, you know, when we announced this new sort of Pro Tools lineup, we also announced that we've stopped selling new perpetual licenses and we're now only selling new subscriptions. So I want to sort of explain a little bit about this because I think there are some, some things which um, maybe some existing users have kind of got a bit confused about. So if you're the owner of a perpetual license of Pro Tools and you're up to date, you paid up on your, your upgrade support plan, then you're all good. You don't have to do anything at all. You are now a Pro Tools Studio owner and you get all of these goodies. So just go to Avid Link. If you haven't got it already, go to Avid Link and download it. And then you'll see the, uh, the update will be available for you. If you're in a perpetual license and you're not up to date, then what we've done, we've introduced uh, a plan called Get Current. So Get Current is an offer which brings your perpetual license up to date. You get all the latest features, then you get 12 months of Pro Tools upgrades. And at the end of that 12 months, you just uh, can kind of renew the upgrade plan and keep your software up to date. And then although Avid has stopped selling perpetual licenses on a web store, our resellers are still selling them until they run out of stock. So if you really want a perpetual license, then go out and get it now uh, whilst, there is, whilst we have stock. So hopefully that's cleared up a few of the... Um, uh, some of the questions that we've had over the past kind of few weeks since we introduced this, uh, and hopefully that makes it clear for you. Um, anyone who's an existing Pro Tools user, then you're going to love Pro Tools Studio. Uh, and hopefully there are some people here who are new to Pro Tools. And I, again, I want to encourage you to get into, into Pro Tools Studio. So with that all the way, I'm going to uh, get into talking with um, Jordan and Damien. So I think we've got some We've got some good stuff to, to talk about, and we will delve into the software features. Um, so that's going, to, that's going to be a big part of what we talk about. But before we do that, um, we sort of chatted beforehand about you know, some of the areas we were going to cover and so on. And, and Damien, I wanted to talk to you first just a little bit about your hardware setup. So say we're going to be doing a lot about software, but you are you know, known as a tracking engineer, and you showed me this very kind of neat um, um, hardware setup. So I wonder if you kind of spend a few minutes just telling us about that. Yeah. So uh, recently I went uh, over to the Carbon as my main interface and it's really been amazing. Uh, first of all, I'd love just kind of the upgrade in sound just immediately right off the bat. I'd love the way that the converter sounded in it and just coming off of my old hardware, the low mids sounded like they were cleaned up. The top end was like very articulate. It was just one of those boxes like and, and this is not even a plug for it. Like just when I plugged it in, the speakers just sounded better immediately. Um, and it's something great for someone like me who travels around LA a lot. I can have my system in a box. I, I have my single rack space carbon and then I have my Mac mini all in like this rolling case. And I like to work off my personal rig wherever I go. So I just pull up to the studio, plug into their HDMI display and plug in a couple mics and the monitor left, right. And I'm up and running with my system. And uh, the, the, the biggest thing really, well, there's two other aspects of it that I love. One is the near zero latency while I'm tracking. So like and Jordan can attest to this, when we track vocals now, the modern paradigm has been and, and will be is we have a bunch of plugins on the monitor path and that includes auto-tune. So that causes a lot of latency. You can use some zero latency plugins, but of course, auto-tune is always gonna have a little thing there. Uh, with the hybrid engine and using Auto-Tune Hybrid, the latency is incredible. It's it's nearly zero. And it's one of those things where 
you could get around it with a low buffer size, but like once you hear near zero latency, it's really difficult to ever go back. It's just like, oh, it just, it kind of opens up everything. And uh, even going back to my old native interface, once I once I hear that, I'm like, oh man, it's, it's so much better having the DSP plugin mm -hmm. chain. Nice. So for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, just to back up a little bit, uh, the Carbon has DSP chips in it, similar to a HDX card. So the plugins on your record track, when you put the track into record mode, those plugins are switched into DSP mode. So they're running off the DSP in the Carbon. And that creates your near zero latency monitoring path. Uh, the other big game changer for me was I like to have plugins on my master fader as I work because I want a limiter on there. I want some comp compression on there. I'm trying to make the record sound mixed from the very beginning. Now I can have DSP plugins on my master fader that are running in zero latency while I'm tracking. So previously, if you had stuff on your master, you know you have to disable it to get rid of the latency when you wanted to track something additionally. Now I have DSP plugins on the master fader right off the jump. Nice. So immediately I'm slamming into the master, everything's loud and punchy and sounding mm -hmm. finished, and I never have to turn that off. Because nice. it was always a pain, you'd have to disable everything, then your mix would change, then you'd turn it back on and have to rebalance everything. So now with the DSP on the master, like everything is slamming right from the beginning. So I've been uh, I've been super excited about this piece. It's really flexible, tons of IO, sounds amazing. So can't say nice. enough good things about it. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> I know you actually <laughs> yeah. the Jordan, I know you obviously you're not you're not tracking your you know, sort of you're spending most of your time sort of uh, mixing and more on that kind of production side. Um, but I know you're working with the carbon as well. So I guess you're using it in a, in a slightly different way just for the I guess the sound quality and that side of it. Yeah, um, I've been on Carbon for close, I think about a year now, maybe a little bit less. Um, and yeah, I mean, most of my workflow is like writing, producing, mixing. Um, obviously, if I'm writing, I am doing some tracking and, you know, whether it's my own vocal or, or, or a songwriter's vocal or, or something else. Um, so I do get, get a, a chance to track a little bit in it. Um, but I just found the, the biggest difference from my previous interface was just the sound quality is like unbelievably uh, different and better. Um, and that's not something that I think is, you know, I mean, some people's ear is like tuned and they can hear it right away. But I, I think for a lot of uh, engineers, producers, mixers, just creatives in, in music, hearing those subtle those like the differences in like two between two interfaces is, like pretty uh a, a challenging task for for many uh, but this was obvious like this this made it like just supremely obvious how much you know clarity you get and the just the punchiness the low end like everything about it just feels uh you know like you've added a dimension to your music so um that was the biggest difference for me um I do use the DSP on occasion, but you know, it's, it's obviously plug-in dependent on certain things. Mm -hmm. And because I'm doing less tracking, it's, it's not always required. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, you know, so that's obviously a fantastic benefit for, you know, obviously Damien, you know, you said you're doing a lot of tracking with it makes perfect sense. Um, and the fact that Autotune was able to, to build a, a latency free version is like amazing. Uh, cause as we all know, it's like a requirement pretty much for any vocal tracking session. Yeah, at this point. 100%. Um, so yeah, but for me, it was just sound quality. It's just like awesome. unbelievably crisp and, and sounds great. Awesome. So as that, so what I want to do now is I'm going to switch, um, from talking about the hardware onto the software and some of the aspects of, of Pro Tools Studio, which have been, um, added from, from Ultimate, which are now available to, to Pro Tools, um, Studio users. And so. The first one I want to talk about is clip effects, and that's something which maybe uh, people who uh, you know just been using Pro Tools software they've not seen it before, they don't know what it's about. So, and I know both of you are using clip effects a lot in in the work that you do. So, tell us a little bit about what it is and and how you use it. I, actually, uh, Jordan, if you yeah, if we if we you if want me to jump in first, yeah, yeah, you sure. go first. And we'll um, in, yeah. So I use clip effects. I mean, so we've all had we've had clip gain for a long time now, and uh, that was sort of where I, you know, started where you're editing clip stuff where, you know, it's just volume stuff. And then, you know, what was it? Two years ago, you guys added clip effects where you could actually compress or EQ or filter or do individual clips, process them differently. 
So for me, that that's a lifesaver because one of the most annoying things, whether you're mixing or producing a record is, you know, sometimes you get bad vocals where like one day it was cut on this mic in this studio and the other day, the other half of the verse is cut on this mic in this studio. And there's, you hear the differences and you hear the performance differences. It's not always just the mic difference. Sometimes it's artist wakes up that day and ate something different and their voice just the delivery sounds different and so um you know historically i would have to separate that vocal to a new track process it differently and it becomes like rather annoying in this case you can get some quick eqing done and still have it run through your same compression chain and still try to control the the signal in the same way but you can get it to blend a lot easier that's where i find i use it uh the vast majority of the time is is um getting a vocal performance to sound like consistent throughout. And by the way, even if it's not recorded on different days, sometimes just the takes are different or the, the vocalist for this one word happen to be closer to the mic and you get more proximity effect, whatever. So you may have to filter out a little more lows or maybe it's add, um, add a little more lows or, or get rid of some of the highs. So I find it, it's incredibly useful for that. And um, yeah, it, it's become like, a necessity on pretty much every track now nice so what about you damien i know as i say you're with all your kind of work with vocals as well i'm sure you kind of you come across the same issues that, that jordan's been talking about yeah absolutely um i was going to show you a little something on my screen here. yeah nice thank you if i could share but yeah jordan jordan nailed that one so and i use it in the exact same manner that he does because like here's the thing i'm lazy so and we're trying to work as quickly as possible and get a lot of stuff done. So you're not lazy, six... you're, you're efficient. And that's what makes <laughs> an engineer, you're efficient. <laughs> right. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Um, so if I'm just, I'm trying to even out a vocal performance. Um, and like Jordan said, the, the nine times out of 10, the way that I use it is because there's something in the comp that just sounds a little different. And generally it's because they're a little closer or they're a little off the mic. So in this case, it's just so easy to grab this and be able to quickly change that single clip. And then you'll see the little EQ light up in the region when you do that. And for me, it saves a layer of automation. Um, it saves perhaps having to redo that part. So yeah, that's the thing for me. And, and I use it all the time in this fashion, but like nine times out of 10, this is what I'm doing. I'm just trying to get a more consistent vocal sound out of the comp without having to automate a plugin. Perfect. Nice. Yeah, thanks for showing us. That definitely, yeah, that definitely makes a big difference sort of um, demonstrating actually in Pro Tools and in, and in a session. Um, and I guess um, another, another uh, sort of feature of, of um, Pro Tools Studio which has again, again, been in uh, in Pro Tools Ultimate for a long time is um, is the advanced automation. Now, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there which, and I, I said already, I could talk for hours on this. There's some a lot of stuff in there, and it was really kind of came into Pro Tools from sort of console workflows. So things like you know when you're you got multiple faders writing at one time, so that you can kind of wind back and it will automatically join your automation and carry on writing and all these kind of things. Uh, you know, with the way that people are used to working with large format consoles. But there's some, also some really, I guess, more kind of um, straightforward stuff, which people use all the time, um, like trim automation. Um, and I think, Damien, again, you've got some examples there of sort of how and why you use trim automation and why that's so important to the way that you work. Yeah, sure. Um, so here's my screen again. And this was something... Um, I picked up a few years ago is basically writing all of my vocal automation in trim mode as opposed to volume automation. And for me, the big advantage of that is you may get all of your parts automated the way you like it. And then you go back and you're like, oh, the vocal's a little loud. Um, and you just wanted to grab the fader and simply bring it down. Well, the thing is, if you do that in volume automation, your fader just snaps back to its original position. But if you write it in trim mode, then you're free to move the fader up and down. And when you hit play, the fader will retain that position. So like a lot of you, um, I had had regular Pro Tools for a long time, which didn't have trim. Um, I'd had it in a larger studio. And then when I went off on my own, I was back to like regular Pro Tools. And, and that function was no longer in 
regular Pro Tools. Um, and that was huge because it like it completely changed the way that I worked. I had to go back to this old method and it really messed up my workflow. So now that it's back in Pro Tools Studio, um, I highly suggest you guys check it out because it's 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 a great way to work. And I'm super excited that that feature is now available at the normal software level. Yeah, and definitely. Bar, you you oh. just sorry, you just taught me something new because I've always done. I always write automation. I have a an S1 here, too. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. got eight faders. That's all I need because I, I like riding a fader like naturally with my hand. Um, but I always do it on volume automation. Then you're right. When 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 the client comes back and is like, turn the vocal up 2 dB, you have to go and like nudge the the volume line up. And yeah, what I would historically do is like I would just nudge the trim line up, but then you don't have it on the fader. So working mm -hmm. the opposite way where you write the automation on the trim or on the um, yeah, I guess the trim side and then just use volume, just use your fader as you normally would. I can't believe I never thought of that. So that's genius. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. As soon as I unlocked that, I was like, oh, this is the way to write automation. Thousand percent. I, can, I, then, I can't even believe I didn't think of like just <laughs> the order there. It's like makes perfect sense. You don't really see anyone do it. It's it's not a very common thing. I think everyone just considered it because of what it's named. Everyone, I think everyone considered it like, oh, it's when you needed to trim something back that was already written. But in my opinion, it's it's the way to write your automation. Yeah, no, it's genius. Nice. We've all learned something already. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna start using. It. I'm like I'm legit gonna start using that. That's because it it does save such a. It's like all the little when you're making music. It's all the little annoying things that they exist everywhere. And it's not even just software stuff. It it just workflows. There's always little things. Uh, we all have our own idiosyncrasies that sort of create, uh, you know, challenges or whatever. And anytime you can solve one of those little things that little pain yep. points, that's like an extra 30 seconds or an extra even 15 seconds. It just means you have more time where you're just being creative and just focusing Absolutely. on like, what's the record sound like. Yeah. Um, and then I love I if you hold down control command and hit the right arrow twice you're in your automation mode Didn't so know you can that quickly way. jump. If you hold control command and click back on the track header, it'll, it'll uh, go back to waveform view, but then you can just go don't do And then now you're in your right mode. Now you're in your automation mode. So I love that quickly go between the two. Yeah, definitely. That command control, especially with the control surface, because you can do command control tap on the fader or an automation oh, yeah. parameter and that will just jump straight to that view. Right. Yeah, there's a there's a lot. So, yeah, that sort of um, I mean, the automation in Pro Tools is 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 pretty you know it's pretty comprehensive. But that advanced automation just kind of takes it up to another level, and just as I say, gives you a whole bunch of different options. And I love the fact, yeah, you, you're talking about you know you've got your trim automation lane, you've got your main automation, you can put VCA automation on top of that. You know, there's a lot of uh, ways to kind of control things and 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 make sure you've got a handle on everything. So yeah, that's that's awesome. It really is. So, um, Jordan, I wanted um, just to sort of switch gears slightly. Um, you are not just a music producer. Uh, you've also become a plugin developer and sort of you've got a nice kind of suite of plugins going, going on. And I just wanted maybe um, it'd be interesting for people to kind of hear about, uh, I guess, what motivated you to get into that, what you kind of thought you'd... Because you know, there's there's so many plugins out there. And it's there like, is. you know, so what what motivated you to sort of kind of get into that world, and how did you how did you start? Well, it, it was sort of a confluence of of issues or thoughts or or just feelings that I had. Um, one, I've I've always been into tech. Um, you know, I've founded a few tech companies, co-founded a few tech companies, and I invest in uh, tech companies and and. Um, so I knew like if I didn't work in music, I that would be a, the field that I would work in some sort of like, you know, product design or, or development of some sort of technology. Um, and so I already had had an interest in it. Uh, and I was looking I was kind of a little bored and just looking for ways to, you know, be just find new ways to be creative. And I thought I was able, you know, to bring some things to the table, my own ideas and, and things that I didn't see other uh, developers doing. Um, but then also, like, if I'm keeping it real, there's, there's, uh, 
you know, I've always worked in pop music. I mean, multiple genres. I've worked in hip hop and EDM and, and, and just straight up down the middle pop and, you know, but generally speaking, it's multiple genres, but everything I do kind of leans towards contemporary radio sounding music. And, you know, I kind of look back and, and there are a few exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking, the sound of music is defined by like 20 year olds, you know, or mid or 25 year olds, like, uh, and I'm in my, my mid thirties now. And so, uh, luckily I'm, I'm still working and I'm still staying busy, but one of those days, like there's going to be some new 22 year old, like sick mixer, who's just crushing it or producers just writing the dopest top lines or making the sickest beats. And like, they're going to be the ones who are getting the calls and, and busy. So for me, I love making music and, and contributing on the technology side of things with plugins was a, a way for me to sort of continue to make a contribution to a business and an, and an industry that I love, um, but just in new ways and in ways that I think are less defined by, you know, youth and, and these sorts of things. So, you know, my own, my own eventual demise is, is part of, uh, part of my thought process and everything. But uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of why I did it. And I, I still think I have a lot to achieve and a lot to, to do there. And obviously we have spread in, in the inner circle program. So anybody who's subscribing to uh, whether you have a Pro Tools Studio or Ultimate or whatever, um, I think everyone gets a copy of spread, right? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. If you're a subscriber, so, yeah. you get spread. So um, yeah, it's a good... we're working, working hard on the next one now too. So nice, nice. Uh, so Jamie, my, I guess, uh, my yeah, B, yeah, my BDE. Them? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I love I love BDE. Um, and Amy's right showing here. all the love today. Yeah, um, I really like it on uh, my kick drum. I have this preset I created. You guys can see it here and mm -hmm. kind of grab the settings. Um, my camera's in the way, so I need to kind of move around to see it. But I have a little bit of bit crush happening, a little bit of compression happening. Um, the distortion algorithm is set to nuke. And yeah, those are my kick drum settings that I like to start with there. So I have a um, question. Do you ever use, so one of the challenges with this plugin was anytime you develop something new, you have to educate the consumer. And that's something that yeah. I'm learning is how, what are the best ways to educate the consumer on certain things? So like, um, this is like the world's first distortion, at least that I'm aware of that has like dynamic preservation is what we called it. Um, but that speed button in the middle and then the range and the speed sliders that are just on the first ring around the, uh, the drive, uh, knob, right. uh, they allow you to sort of reclaim any dynamics that are lost. So you could actually like put a distortion on a reverb tail. And if you drag that range down, um, you won't get like, if anybody doesn't know how distortion works, you basically just increase the gain until it hits a threshold and starts crushing your signal. And, you know, that's the the simplest way of, of putting it. Uh, but sometimes you don't want to have like an in your face loud thing. You still want to have the effect and the grittiness, but you still want to have a, a nice smooth reverb tail. So it allows you to do that. And I just wonder if, did you even know that that existed or do you? Ever yeah, I did. Um, and, and I'm a real dork with this stuff too. Like I still, anytime I get a new plugin, I like to read the manual and watch the videos and like actually really get an in-depth understanding. So you're that one person has, who downloaded the manual. Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> That's it. me. Yeah. Um, because even the way that you set up the gain staging, I think is kind of crucial to the plugin, right? To, to be able to get the distortion to hit at a certain threshold and then the auto gain to kick in. So I feel like this plugin, although the GUI is super easy to understand, you can dive right into it, but actually understanding how to set your input gain right from the very beginning kind of like you, allows you to get you the, use most the mag out of this Do you plugin. use the inspector for that? Yeah. Uh -huh. So you just hit the magnifying glass, play some music yep. and it'll adjust your, your, yep. uh, your signal. Yeah. So yeah, we try to do little things like that again, like because I'm an engineer and, and a producer and I work on music all the time and I work with other people's plugins all the time. Like I'm always looking for those little, uh, time savings. If I can save somebody 20 seconds here by adding a, a feature, like those are the wins in, in my book. Uh, so we try to on every product, at least add something new that you haven't seen before. Hopefully yeah, you've done a great job with that. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So I want to stay on the subject of mixing because, um, as I said at the beginning, that 
the fact that you've not just got surround in Pro Tools Studio, but but Dolby Atmos. And I know that's a, you know, there's a big push on Dolby Atmos right now. Apple's um, kind of introduced spatial audio into Apple Music probably just about a year ago. Um, and that's really kind of um, kickstarted the industry and really kind of driven the demand for kind of more Dolby Atmos and spatial audio content. So, yeah, I'd be interested to kind of hear from both of you because I know you've both been uh, kind of mixed, done some Atmos mixing. Um, so how you've got on with that um, and obviously maybe some tips for uh, people who are kind of just starting out and, and want to try it out. Maybe if you've got some uh, some uh, you know tips and tricks as, as they get going. So I don't know who wants, who wants yeah. to take that first. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I've been mixing on Atmos for uh, at least eight months now since uh, sometime mid or, or uh, early mid last year. And um and yeah, I mean, it's it's been a unique process in in learning it. Um, you know, there there's obviously a few uh, technical hurdles, and and Pro Tools, uh, you know, solves a lot of those problems and makes it fairly easy. Um, but really, the learning curve is like, what is a good Atmos mix? This is a question that I've worked with ARs and artists, and everyone seems to have a different opinion. What what makes a good Atmos mix? And and I think. That's actually a good thing because we're in the process of sort of figuring it out. What do people actually like? Um, because, you know, on one hand, you can you have all this like flexibility of motion and space where you can do some really wild and crazy things. But then it begs the question, are those, you know, if you're having a vocal spin around your head and jump over you or whatever, um, do these things create more distraction? and take away from the music. And you have to find that that thin line, that balance where you can add emotion to the music and creativity to the music by having this, this, uh, you know, third dimension, if you will. Um, but, um, or I guess, well, yeah, third dimension, we'll call it. Uh, and, um, and yeah, like, you know, or, or how, how do you balance like the, the creative layers of it and just have it, sounding sonically great and you know spacing things out so i found like a good balance for me is like there might be one sound or the odd sound that you can sort of put a spotlight on and do something crazy with have it spin around your head or fly do flybys or things like that a lot of sound effects great great to kind of use use it for that but the the meat and potatoes of a record like kicks snares vocals bass you know i tend to keep sort of centered and then space everything else out around it um yeah it's been it's been great working in it and you know i think we're all kind of figuring it out and and uh you know i'm excited to hear like what other other people are are doing with it as well because it's sort of all a learning process at this point absolutely how about you damien how's your experience been yeah it is interesting like jordan said it's it's kind of the wild west right now we don't have a set of best practices necessarily like with stereo you had a lot of limitations it was kind of left right center and this is what you got so um, I'm mixing in the binaural world meaning I'm just mixing with headphones at home because I don't have uh, you know 27 amphions in here yet but this is the one thing that I that I've found really interesting and that's like piqued my curiosity and this is something that all of you at home can also do is What's interesting to me is now mixing in the binaural world with headphones on, now I'm mixing specifically for a format that the listener's actually going to hear. So we're kind of in this space right now where mixing engineers are still mixing on a set of stereo speakers. And I might be one of the only people to listen to that record on two speakers in a, in a like traditional hi-fi environment with two speakers in front of me. It's not the 70s anymore where everyone has a hi-fi system at home. So my end user, most of them are listening to records on the iPhone, on their AirPods and on sound bars and in their car. So with the binaural world, I can actually make a mix sound amazing in headphones. And my end user is actually going to listen to that mix in the same way. And that's really exciting for me because now you can do crazy things in headphones that will actually translate to the consumer. So I'm sure anyone at home that's ever mixed on headphones has like made an amazing mix in headphones and then listened to it on like a set of speakers and it sounded like total garbage. 
And then you have like a translation problem. It's like, well, that mix isn't really going to work in the real world because it sounds terrible. Now we can actually mix in Atmos, binaural with headphones on, make insane sounding mixes in headphones and know that most likely the consumer is also going to listen to it in the same way with their headphones or their AirPods or something like that. So that's exciting for me is like just creating this entirely new environment that I know is going to translate to the person listening to it. And just to add to what you're saying, like when the Atmos stuff really started coming to prominence, like, you know, there's a number of engineers who go and have built a huge Atmos studio with, like you said, 27 Amphions or, you know, uh, PMCs or, or whatever. Um, I actually think mixing Atmos binaurally is, is and should be the preferred method because the reality is it's like literally a fraction of a fraction of of a fraction of one percent of people are actually going to be able to re-listen to those atmos mixes in an atmos room nobody's going to get the opportunity to do that um and so you might as well mix for the format they're going to listen which is like 99.99 percent of the time going to be headphones so i think that's really cool because the last couple decades we actually as mixing engineers we kind of lost the ability to mix for the format that music was listened on. We had to interpret. Right. Yeah. Where back uh-huh. in like the sixties and seventies, you know, nearly a hundred percent of the consumers were actually listening on a set of speakers. Yeah. So now we can mix specifically for headphones, make things sound amazing in headphones and know that the listener is going to enjoy it in the same way. So, and uh, it's really cool because in Pro Tools now you have your surround panner, get Dolby renderer and set and plug in your headphones and, And you're rocking. It's super easy to do. Yeah. And there's no rules right now, which is really fun. We're kind of like, uh, I feel like it's the, it's the audio guys that like are going to step in and figure out how to break the thing. (laughs) We're already like pushing things into the LFE channel. We shouldn't be and putting 808s in the center channel that just like blow your face off because it's no longer just like a left, right thing, creating a phantom image in the center. So now like I'm literally shoving the 808 and the kick in the center channel and it just sounds like it's smacking you right in the forehead. Um, so it's really fun because, and we're figuring out how to like take reverbs or delays and just um, not to get too much into the weeds of how the Atmos thing works, but you have a 7.1 surround bed in your Pro Tools session, which is kind of like your master fader essentially. And then you have your objects, which are uh, places in space that you can put a sound. So now we can take these sounds, like I might take a delay return from Echo Boy and just put it like in the far back corners and just have it come back there. Um, and there's all sorts of cool ways to use this to manipulate the image around you. So, and, and there's no like set rules right now. We're all still figuring this stuff out. So it, yep. it's actually really fun in that respect. It's a whole new world. Yeah. No, as you say, and the great news, of course, is that uh, everything you're talking about, rather than because there's there's quite a big jump with with Atmos mixing, right? You're either got a pair of headphones, so just a two channel interface, and a good pair of headphones, and you're away, or it's like a you know sort of minimum you know hundred thousand dollars and stuff, yeah, (laughs) exactly. So and there's really there's really nothing in between, so. uh, yeah. So yeah, it's 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 great to have that kind of opportunity. And I actually probably should also mention, um, just as part of the the kind of the, the, the Pro Tools Studio uh, subscription, you get the Dolby Atmos production suite for uh, for one third of the normal price. So again, it's just kind of lowering the bar- barrier to entry to for people to be uh, kind of mixing in Atmos using the tools that um, you know all these mixes are being done in. So this is definitely uh, uh, an area of interest, and loads of, I'm sure it will be um you know that will it's a it's a journey that we're on as you say we're kind of at the start of the journey um everyone's learning and uh so yeah i think you know kind of getting into it is is, it's a good good time to be uh to be playing around with dolby atmos and playing around with your mixing yeah and just so you guys know out there it's a it's a two-part thing so you need to have the dolby renderer software also Mm -hmm. that's basically where you print your final mix to so that runs alongside with pro tools I have a question for Damien, actually, do you, you've done a fair bit of Atmos, right? So are you using the renderer kind of as a tape machine where you're recording into it, or are you just bouncing straight out of Pro Tools and just, it's connected to the renderer on the output, but you're, you're still bouncing your ADM, BWF or whatever through Pro Tools. 
Like an yeah, I know that you can bounce your ADM through Pro Tools, but I haven't done that yet. I've been doing everything through the renderer. Do you use the Dolby Panner or the built-in Pro Tools Avid one? That's a good question because they are very different. Um, and I use them I use them for different things because basically all we're doing in the binaural world in order to make something sound like it is behind you or below you or to the sides is we're manipulating phase and reverb to create that sense of space that doesn't physically exist. And I think that the panner, the Pro Tools built-in surround panner and the Dolby renderer handle that in very different ways their algorithms to actually make something have that sense of space. So I kind of pick and choose um, depending on what the source is. Well, the music the panel has, is... Yeah, the music panel has got lots of kind of, I guess, specific um, options for like more kind of sequencer based panning and all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah, that's um, the coolest feature of the Dolby one is the built in sequencer. So you can just make something go ju 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 and then it just does it. Yeah. We we're getting a lot of questions now. We're talking about Atmos, of course. Uh, the questions start coming in. Um, so uh, we've got a Andrew bunch of Sheps questions coming here. in. That's very, yeah. <laughs> okay, easy one then. Uh, what headphones do you mix on? This is for both of you. I have uh, Sennheiser HD 650s. I also have a pair of Sennheiser HD 800s, but I find that they are just so alien to what music actually sounds like. I mean, they're incredible headphones. <laughs> But they're they're it, it going back to you know now we're in this world where every we can mix using Atmos you mix in headphones and everyone else is going to listen and get the same uh, thing that generally makes sense if all headphones kind of sort of ish sound the same which mm -hmm. you know many do they have their differences but that HD eight hundred is like different it just it does it just sounds so crisp in a way that feels alien so i don't you generally mix in it the 650s are the great rep a great balance of what a speaker would give me in headphones yeah same i have the um sennheiser 6xx's modified by Mastrop. oh yeah oh you got the master yeah so these are they're yeah. actually the same headphone i just i think i have a longer cable than you do <laughs> right I, i'm pretty sure that's the different that's the same thing you know yeah, oh. um, but I just ordered it. In there work, work great. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just ordered a set of the new uh, Manny Marquin Audis um, that look oh, amazing. Yeah, great. yeah. I, I'm really keen to try those out. They were announced. There, uh, yeah, I just listened to them now, right? and, and they sound amazing. So that's kind of yeah. like the upgraded version of the LCD Xs. So, mm. uh, yeah, so those, I, those. I met I met the, the gentleman who um, I actually went down and visited the Odyssey a factory and um they do uh magnetic planner planar mm -hmm. headphones i think so it's a different yeah. technology they don't have drivers that are yeah are uh, pushing air um so a completely different technology and how they how they they actually showed me the whole process of how they make them it's actually remarkably interesting um wow, cool yeah they're amazing headphones they sound yeah. incredible so. yeah yeah well that's that's interesting yeah i think um there was another question about um where the headphones i mean the, basically you, yeah you're mixing just on regular headphones because of course that's as you mm -hmm. say that's what people are going to be listening to and you're listening to the uh the, the binaural mix coming out of the renderer so that's again you want to be hearing what the end user is going to be hearing yeah and then it's super easy to also in the render you export your file as an m4a mm -hmm. uh, which is like apple's apple's format basically and then you can just drop that on your iphone and plug in your airpods and and listen exactly how the consumer is going to listen to yeah that's yeah, that's your reference file that you send your clients also the m4a file yeah so actually so cool. i guess one more just on on the atmos thing as i say that's always generates some um, generates questions so um how do you so kind of see the the adoption as i said we've kind of you know we had this initial um push based on, you know, on Apple Music, even though, um, you know, Amazon and Tidal were doing it already, uh, obviously Apple Music coming on board really sort of um, pushed things along quickly. How do you sort of see that adoption? How do you see that um, progression of Atmos kind of uh, content as well, you know, alongside stereo or, or, uh, or even taking over, you know? I mean, I, I think people are gonna, they're gonna make a choice. They're gonna try, they're gonna listen to both and see what they like better. Um, I wish there was an easier way in Apple Music um, 
to just like have an instant button where you can switch back and forth where you don't have to go into a settings menu and then adjust and whatever. Like I should just be able to like click, let me hear Natmos and it just swaps the file from the exact same point. Uh, Cause our, our delivery requirements are that uh, the stereo mix uh, and the Atmos mix have to have the exact same start point, the exact same to the sample endpoint. Uh, everything has to be identical. Um, and that's so that they can line the two, two sounds up and, and uh, you know, have that, have that swap over. But I find it's like, you gotta, there's a few steps to, to get it to switch over. So I just wish that uh, they would have like an AB so that people could listen and be able to hear instantly, like which they like better. And then that would allow them to kind of like use mm -hmm. that as their default listening method. So a, a, a little, a little re request from Apple if they're listening. <laughs> and presumably you, you, uh, you know, you do your stereo mix and then you do like an Atmos version separately. You, you'd never derive a stereo mix from the Atmos. No, mix, right? every right. Atmos mix I've done. And Damien, maybe you have a different um, a, a approach to this, but is always working off stems. So, and in some cases I'm doing both mixes. Uh, the stereo and the Atmos, in which case I finish my stereo mix, get it approved, uh, print it, goes to mastering, album's done, uh, then print the stems and then start the Atmos mix process as a separate, you know, project basically. Um, and then in other cases, I'm just doing the Atmos and a client sending me their mix stems. So, but it always comes from the end mix uh, stem. Uh, and I, I'm generally not making any changes like in rare cases sometimes but i'm generally not making any mix changes to the the sound of things i'm um i'm just putting them in a space so yeah. atmos mixes i find are much quicker i can my version of atmos mix i can get done in half an hour or less um depending on the size of the song and how much need work needs to go into it but i don't know damien do you have a how, what's your atmos workflow or like are, are you able to get one of those mixes done in half an hour or yeah you, totally it's it's exactly the same um yeah. even like yesterday was, i worked on a record that i mastered i didn't mix it they just asked me to master it and do the atmos mix yeah. um so a little different flow but again i was working from stems and yeah i'm just kind of building a space i'm not trying to rewrite anything i'm just trying to fan it out in a in an interesting way yeah. um but the same way yeah i would always want to work from stems. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One, it's just easier to manage. And uh, having a, it's still very like uh, CPU intensive to start using a lot of surround effects. And um, yeah. so, so having a, like a slim down stem session, I feel like allows me to kind of get through the mix in a more reasonable way. Facts. Um, whether or not this format catches on, I don't know. I mean, I might get in trouble for this, but like, I, I don't know if the kids care. I, I feel like the kids are the ones that dictate where music goes and how we listen to music. I feel like right now, this is consumerism happening. You know, these are companies kind of forcing a format and a technology on people to buy things and to like listen to things in a certain way and subscribe to things. And well, I think it's cool and interesting and kind of fun. Ultimately, who knows? I don't know if it's going to catch on with the kids or if they just really like the way things work right now and it's going to be that way for the next 20 years. I, I do see it taking off in like the metaverse and in like virtual worlds. I mm -hmm. think immersive stuff where you're kind of living in that world and head tracking and stuff makes sense when you're at a concert. Or um, So I do definitely see a place for it there and like in cinema. But in terms of just like, uh your typical way that we consume music um i'm not really sure so yeah i yeah. agree it's it's uh yet yet to be determined whether it'll uh catch on but i'm sure there's people in the in the chat who uh who are sort of that demo who like are you guys listening to atmos mixes or do you find that you're just sticking a stereo i mean yeah and that's a good question yeah, a, yeah everyone's... almost 300 people in here somebody's somebody's got an opinion on it <laughs> definitely so. um actually so just there is, there's a couple of questions which are about um, the uh, just, more, I guess, more kind of the general mixing side of things and, and confidence checking and that kind of thing. So do, when, you, uh, when you do your mix, and maybe this applies to um, 
uh, Atmos mixers as well. And I don't know if you have the ability to kind of check them elsewhere, but when you, when you do a mix, what kind of, what do you do about checking it in different environments to make sure it, it sounds, uh, it sounds good. And if you, do you try any of those plugins, which kind of emulate the space? Uh, and, and again, it's that sort of, um, that world of kind of binaural emulation. And there's a few plugins out there. Now, about like the slate, um, VSX. Yeah, that's yeah. one. And there's they, exactly, there's a few sort of, a, of that kind of thing. So yeah. Do you sort of, do you take your, your mix to, to some places that you know, or do you ever try any of these kind of virtual spaces? When, when I mix a, a record, um, first of all, I, I do use a VSX, um, on occasion. I don't, I don't mix in it, but I'll reference reference on them and um but a lot of times i'm like finish a mix i want to listen to it literally on my phone speaker just to see like am i getting everything i want out of it obviously you're not getting a lot of bass or anything like that um listen in the car uh listen i have like a home speakers in my house like listen through those i try to listen in like normal environments not because i have like a, a, a beautiful speakers i'm using gentle x and um you know, my room sounds better than, you know, 99.99% of people's listening environment. So I want to hear it on regular shit, pretty much. Um, that That's my only, only goal, but it, nothing, it, it's, there's no, like, I don't have a set plan or workflow. I just like start listening to it or anywhere I'm at just to see like, oh, does that work? Okay, cool. Uh, and I also try to like not listen too critically when I'm doing those things to see what am I picking up on, what bothers me just naturally and not like when I'm laser focused on it. Uh, so that's usually my flow. Yeah, I do the same. Um, I have a couple of Bluetooth speakers. I have a Bose one and I have a, a, a Beats Pill. So I'll list on those. I mix on Amphion 118s uh, with the Flexbase sub. And then I have a, a set of cubes like the Reftone cubes, and then I have the IK iLouds. Um, basically, with all of that stuff, I'm just trying to hear base consumer playback, just trying to hear how things sound on a normal system. Um, and then like Jordan does, I love to actually use audio movers on my master fader and send that to my phone. And then I'll literally mix through my phone. I'll make adjustments to the mix and turn off my speakers and just listen through my iPhone. Oh, I don't do so that. I'm, I just bounce and listen, but you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I I literally make sure, uh, like, I'll make changes based on the phone. Oh wow! Um, Great. Yeah, nothing like insanely extreme, but like I'm just trying to, just trying to make sure everything kind of sounds right in that world. Because like, I don't know, man. I run into so many people that are just blasting music out of their phone, and just kind of seems like the wave. So yeah. Um, and I'll listen in the car and stuff, but like, same thing. I just try to like get a general overview of like how all these environments sound not really take one thing to heart but if i notice something weird in multiple places then i know that it's probably a problem yeah, yeah. cool we i've got some a few interesting questions just to, to cover so i think um there's one uh specific specifically for damien i know right the kind of back um near the beginning you showed your well you talked a bit about um you know using carbon and, and having the plugins on your um on your on your master fader and so on so yeah. the question was do, do you actually mix with that all those kind of live on your master fader or do you put those on kind of later in the, in the mix process no i'm very much like once it's on there we're working into it and that becomes okay. the dna of the thing you can't take it off after that because everything's going to fall apart i mean you could but i wouldn't recommend it but that's kind of what i'm going for is like i want to make the record sound finished from the very first end of day bounce that we make till the final mix. So that stuff mm. becomes part of the sound. Right. There's one, so this is one I think is an interesting one, which is um, the question is, how do you figure out a vocal chain within new artists? And, and I guess maybe the question is also, um, do you have like a set vocal chain that you use or uh, how much do you kind of uh, move it around when you're working with a, with a new artist? Um, it's, it's typically a, a, a pretty set thing in the places that I work with and the people that I work with. It's usually some sort of iteration of a Neve mic pre, like a 1073 or 1081. 
and the ubiquitous compressor, the CL1B, um, mainly because like they just work. They're it, it's very forgiving. It's got a huge sweet spot to it. You can use a lot of gain reduction and kind of pin the vocal in place nicely. And they're in almost all of the studios. Uh, it's not that it's like, you know, insurmountably better than anything else that's made, but like it's just kind of become something that works and is available and, and widely used. Um, I have a pretty specific plug-in chain on my record track that I use that really kind of makes the vocal sound finished. And I guess the biggest thing would just be like uh, mic selection. So like, if you have the luxury of putting up two different mics, seeing which one you like better, that's great. If you don't, it's okay because at this point in the game, like we're just trying to capture data because we can do so much on the back end. We can manipulate sounds in so many ways with EQ and compression and saturation. Honestly, like a hundred dollar mic versus a ten thousand dollar mic by the time you EQ and compress it, it's not a huge difference. And you know, the the person at the end of the day listening probably isn't going to know. So just use what you got, make the best of it. Yeah, I agree. Um, I always like I joke with my engineer friends. Uh, I always say I'm an I'm an earhead, not a gearhead. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. And w what I mean by that is like you just what you said. You use what you have available to you. If you want to go buy a ten thousand dollar mic, like okay, go ha have at it. But it's definitely not the difference maker between a uh, a bad song and a great song a great song is a good idea you know it's it's a it's it requires you know uh a unique approach to production it requires like looking inside and like what am i going to write about how am i going to say it in a clever way that will resonate with people and like these are the things that make songs good not you know the the price of the mic um yeah and so nobody cares no, nobody cares. It's not, but it's interesting because I think one thing that we all share in music is this, um, a certain level of imposter syndrome. Uh, and for those that don't know, like imposter syndrome, basically telling yourself, like, I'm not good enough. Why am I here? I shouldn't, I shouldn't be doing this. Everyone's so much better than me. We all feel it. Um, and the, I found that like in music people, the, the solution to that feeling of imposter syndrome is go buy more stuff. <laughs> so yeah, the uh, magic bullet, the mad. Yeah, exactly. And the reality is like, you know, that doesn't change anything unless that stuff is going to change your mentality and how you're approaching the record or, or anything like that. Um, it's not really actually doing anything. So it's just a bit of a placebo effect. Um, so yeah, it's use, use what you have available to you because, Trust me, some of these kids right now are making hit records on uh, an old laptop with, you know, cracked software and 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 that's it. And there's and they're making hit records. So uh, hopefully with with the, that hit record money, they'll go buy the stuff. But but the point is, you don't need to go crazy to um, uh, to be able to make a good record. You don't have to spend a ton of money. You, you can all the tools are available now. Um, I think it's a matter of being in a, you know, if you have pro tools, make sure, you know, you know what you're doing in it, get comfortable. Like comfort is more important than anything to me. Just being able to like be creative and not have the technology get in the way. So, yeah. Learn the tools that you have. Like mm -hmm. I did a um, little demo mix for Nam for, for Avid that I think will be up pretty soon. And I used all stock plugins and it came out really good. Um, it, it was a really fun exercise as someone who has every plugin known to man, <laughs> but, and I love showing my mix templates and like the little tricks I do and how I route stuff. But at the end of the day, none of that really matters. It's, a, it's about what's between your ears and you can use any of the tools that you have at your disposal to get there. It's not, uh, the reason me or swivels mixes sound the way they do isn't because we have some plugin that you guys don't have, or, or you've never seen before or the way we route our parallel compression, the EQ choices, you know, like it, it's just about, it's about taste and about um, kind of knowing what you want and, and knowing how to get there. Not, not necessarily about the gear. Taste number one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is good. Um, love this uh, comment. Someone's, someone's put in, I'm a kid and we care. I think that was I, I read that. I think that was in in reference to like yeah, absolutely. It was, your, it was your question. So, no, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. That's a great about answer. Amos. 
Love yeah. it. Okay. Love it. Good to yeah. know. Well, it's good to Thanks, know. Yeah. Do your friends care? That's the question. Right. <laughs> no, because you, you're, you're in a you're in an avid uh, uh, webinar right now. So, what about your friends who are playing Fortnite or or uh, Roblox? <laughs> what are they? What about they... your girlfriends? Yeah. Does your girlfriend care about Atmos, <laughs> or is it just you know? We we gotta we gotta understand this. Yeah, um, we do. It's interesting you used the word emotion though a bit earlier on when you talked about Atmos. And I do think there's something about um there's sort of a, an emotional aspect that if people don't even they have no idea that there's, you know, kind of what Atmos is and what immersive is and what sound coming around, they just feel there's something different about it and they're kind of inside the music. I think a good Atmos mix can do that. I think a good I mean that's music in general. I think music mm. is is designed we create music to make you feel something, anything. Mm. Um, and by the way, that's hard because as a songwriter and as a, as a producer, like, you know, I can, I can make a lot of like great sounding records, but that doesn't mean they all connect and, and evoke a feeling or an emotion or anything. And that's a hard thing to sort of figure out. So if you're able to introduce that, whether it's via Atmos through that technology or just through, clever songwriting or really um, uh, interesting emotional chords that sort of make somebody feel something that's what music's about the the worst music is stuff that you listen to and you're like yeah i feel nothing you know yeah. so uh anytime you can add a little bit of emotion to it and if atmos does that for certain people then i think it will absolutely catch on and become become a you know a staple yeah uh, definitely so Good, good. So we, yeah, we got, um, I think a lot of the questions coming in, there's a lot to do with the kind of the, um, the nuts and bolts and craft, uh, uh, craft of working in Atmos. And I think um, certainly from, we should do like a, a follow-up session talking a bit, bit more about that stuff, that stuff and not getting into it now. There was one actually around, uh, somebody asked about the new Pro Tools search feature. So I just would say uh, we did uh, maybe about six weeks ago, we did, uh, a session where we kind of introduced all of the um, kind of the new features in Pro Tools. So I'd just encourage you to go to the the Avid Pro Tools YouTube channel and check out some of those things we've put up there to kind of show you what's new in Pro Tools. But I think um, maybe just to finish off with the two of you, maybe just to be interesting to find out um, kind of what's next for you. So uh, you're obviously busy people, you've got a lot going on. So uh, what have you got coming up? What's exciting? Well, I'll jump in just because I see uh, somebody, Steve Foster asked a question, do you use any dedicated channel strip plugins? So um, obviously on my journey of, of creating plugins, I'm always trying to come up with what's the next thing? What, what, what do I care about next? Because um, I have to prioritize like what I'm, I can't just build every idea at once. Uh, the next plugin we're building is actually a channel strip. Um, I'm convinced that it's going to be the best channel strip ever created. I might be a little biased. Um, but that was sort of the challenge to to my development team and and the people who I'm working with, collaborating with to like build these things was we're not going to build a channel strip unless we think we can make the best channel strip ever created. Otherwise, there's too many of them. A lot of people have, you know, if we can't bring something to the table, add something new um, and make it unique and interesting and, and valuable, we're not going to do it. Hmm. So um, I think we've created a number of innovations on it that you have probably not seen on a channel strip um, that are going to be incredibly useful. Um, you know, and it's not just a matter of like throw every effect at it. It's like, what are the most useful effects on a channel strip? So anyways, um, typically I haven't used a single channel strip plugin. I've, I've usually kind of on my every once in a while, I, I, I like the um, VMR from Slate, but uh, most of the time I'm using like a dedicated de or compressor and EQ and, whatever else I'm using. In this case, I think I've been able to, you know, we're still in development, but we'll be able to have a product that you could just throw on a vocal and get everything you want out of it, including multiple compressors. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm focused on. And yeah, just built a new studio and just getting back into writing and, and uh, focus on that too. So I just moved into a new house. So it's been a, an adjustment period the last few months. Yeah, no, we've we've seen. I think uh, seen your studio um, coming together in the past couple of weeks as we've been talking. So it's uh, yeah, good to see it. yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, looking great. So how about you, Damien? Um, I just opened the chat. There's actually some great stuff in here. There's, there's some cool stuff and some really funny <laughs> some stuff. Some great stuff. We could Which we is, could keep going. Avid stock hours. plugins are amazing. <laughs> yes, they are. And and our friend the kid, uh, he said, "My friends do not," which I think is in reference of if they care or not. 
Yeah. And then he also said, not, he said he has, does not have a girlfriend. He said, I do not have, I don't have a girlfriend. So, um, you never know. Summer's coming up. Maybe yeah. things will change for you. Yeah. If you start mixing in Atmos, you'll get one. They'll it's, be lining it's, up. It's uncuffing season. No, let's not, not mislead. Okay. Let's not mislead. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, there's some cool stuff in here. Um, I'm currently uh, around town tracking with a bunch of people and finishing up Justin Timberlake's new album. It's getting closer and closer. Um, so I kind of split my time between here at the house mixing and um, in any given studio with any given producer or artist. Um, yeah, so I'm just, I'm just kind of around LA doing my thing right now. Um, for channel strips, I'm kind of like Swivel, the same thing. I'm actually really looking forward to yours and checking it out. It'd be cool to have all of those tools. I'll get you a beta. One. Does yours, um, does it have multiple DSers or is it have some dynamic yeah. EQ or? Yeah, there's um, there's dynamic EQ. There's you can have multiple DSers. You can have cool. up to up to three compressors. There's a limiter. There's a gate. There's some other things I'm not going to talk about yet. Uh, but we're we're doing um, yeah. And and the key in that is like the biggest challenge in making a channel strip is how do you deliver all of the functionality and workflow but you also have to make sure the plugin is not overly complex to use and yeah. to, you know, you got to be able to open it up and immediately know what you're doing and where you're going and how you're doing it. Um, and so we're working really hard to create, you know, even s simple things like color coordination on knobs and things. So you understand what the, the you're getting visual feedback on everything you do. So it, it makes the plugin that much easier to use. Um, and I know we, we talked a little offline. You're like, yeah, I'm, I'm reading the manuals and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's great. And that's wonderful, but like most people don't. And so the goal is how do you create something that everyone understands how to use is rich with functionality, um, is not complex to look at and, and interact with. Um, and generally speaking, you don't have to use a manual. So yeah, it's tough. It's a challenge, but, but I, I'm, I'm excited. I think we're going to get there. Yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, currently, you know, been waiting for the Fab Filter channel strip for years now. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but um, kind of live and die by that stuff. And I love all of my SSL channel strips, of course. Um, mainly the Brainworks ones are the ones that I'm using. Although the Waves ones are great too, but um, you know, I'm not I'm not too precious with it. I have, I have so many at this point, and now it just kind of comes down to like, do I want this color or do I, am I just bored with this and kind of want to like be inspired in a different way? So, yeah. you know, yeah. I'll use pretty much anything, but, um, Oh, anonymous is funny. Whoever this is, they saw my session. Um, yeah. Stranger things. I wish I could play this for you guys. Cause it's a really great record. Her name is Ali Salort. Um, she's a new artist, pop Wansel and Roger produced this and, uh, some randoms also shout out to some randoms. Um, he saw that this was the song that I put up. Uh, can't play it, unfortunately. The song is out, but um, yeah, I wish I could show you guys. But thanks for yeah. thanks for catching that. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. Nice one. Well, thank you so much uh, to both of you. I know um, you know for giving up your time uh, this morning. It's it's been it's been a real pleasure having you on and uh, discussing all of these. You know, the craft and the art of what you do has been amazing, um, and hopefully, people have learned a little bit about. Um, uh, Pro Tools Studio as well along the line, along the line. So thanks again. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Thank you. you. Cheers. See you.